Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Tuesday, May 6th, 2025, and today we're going to talk about fertilizing and three sisters plantings. Is microalgae the hottest new soil amendment and a little day in the life? So let's do it. All right. Well, happy Tuesday, everyone. I hope you all are well and that your week is picking up nicely. Let's see. Yesterday, I got some ginger planted. Uh, since ending the market, ginger has not been a huge you know, market item for us uh, in terms of like wholesale or retail stuff. So uh, I just planted enough kind of for ourselves on the ends of our tunnel, literally the ends of the beds. Like I'm just taking that space that we don't normally use and putting some ginger in it. It's not the ideal location necessarily or the ideal preparation, but uh, we can get some decent ginger from that. It t- they stay mulched all year, so it's an, it's an easy spot for it. Tunnels in general, though, are great for ginger, not just for the heat and humidity control, but uh, the moisture control as well. Ginger doesn't always love our thick, wet clay. You know, it's kind of from like sandy or volcanic soils that get a lot of moisture, but it drains really quickly. Uh, So it's nice we can control the wetness a little bit. I got some tarps moved around so I could uh, plant some sweet potatoes today in theory, uh, so long as I can find the time. In fact, time is something that has been on my mind uh, a lot recently. Specifically, Hannah and I get an unreal number of requests every week to see the farm, and we have to say no to all of them. For one uh, simple and very boring reason, as you can probably imagine, I have almost zero time or capacity for anything beyond what I already do. And if I even have time for that is a little bit questionable. So for better or worse, I thought I would kind of just share what my general day looks like, Uh, not just as a market gardener, but also somebody who has two jobs doing market gardening and content creation. Well, right now, my alarm is set at 2.50 a.m. on Monday through Friday. I get out of bed and immediately make a French press of half-calf coffee, half-calf so I so I don't feel bad or out of my mind when I drink a bunch of it. I finalize the notes for the day's show and start work on the notes for the next two days. I work on those from around 3 a.m. until roughly 6.30 when I make uh, breakfast for the family before they shuffle off to school. Then around uh, 7 or thereabouts is when I like hit record and do this part that you're seeing right now. It is 7.15 a.m. as I record this. After that, I get all the B-roll for the video all ready for Mike to edit it all together, which he does a great job. Thanks, Mike. When Mike gets in, we usually chat for a few minutes and go over uh, show notes and talk about how Kentucky has stupid weather. Uh, And then I head out to farm while he gets to work on the edit for the day. Uh, What constitutes heading out to farm is obviously different every day, but today we'll likely be harvesting a little bit of lettuce in the morning and maybe then planting some of those sweet potatoes if I get the time. Then I'll come back in uh, and check the edit while Mike takes a breather from listening to me blabber on about, well, today, today it would be just the day. Then I usually cook lunch while he finalizes the edit. Then we eat. Mike heads home and I take my power nap. The nap is not going to get enough attention uh, in this breakdown here, but it is the only reason I I can do any of this. It makes all of it possible. After my nap, I will turn on Kentucky Sports Radio or some other uh, usually non-farm related podcast and crank out a couple or to a few hours uh, outside working before going to pick up the kids if that's if it's my turn that day. Then I may also do a little work, uh, but I may also rest if we have soccer practice that night and just kind of hang out. Then it's soccer practice. Uh, Dinner after that and a bit more hang time with the kiddos and then off to bed early, usually but not always before 9 p.m. Now, I know from experience talking about this that folks are going to point out that this does not sound super healthy which is not untrue. Most people need more sleep. Most people need more time. It isn't going to be healthy for most people. I am probably also most people. But for me, I have been doing this for a long time, like almost seven years now. And although this daily show has certainly heightened the challenge a bit over the last year, I'm also getting you know weekends off for the first time, I think in my life. So that helps balance things out. Uh, it took me many, many years to train myself to get up as early as I do. Uh, it took many, many years to train myself to have an effective nap even. Uh, uh, none of it comes naturally or or easily. I guess it's the work of like focus and dedication and stupidity and, and half-calf. So why do I do it to myself? Well, one thing, it's fun. I, I like being busy. I like the challenge of being disciplined and the challenge of being creative every day. I appreciate the balance of doing something physical and relatively simple, like planting a bed of lettuce or whatever, you know, farm task needs to be done that day after doing something very cerebral, like answering questions and talking about farming. I also feel good about the work as a whole, uh, about helping people take care of this incredible rock we live on. 
I want to leave no room for feeling guilty when my kids or grandkids ask me what I did to preserve the planet and make it awesome for when they get older, for them, for their kids, for their kids' kids. That weighs heavy on me, to be honest with you, especially as more and more uh, environmental air and water protecting regulations are dismantled. So I will sustain it as long as I can. And when I can't any longer, I will stop and or just take a break. But all of that to say, hopefully I will be forgiven for not having any time left to show the farm to you, you wonderful people. I would love to do that just can at this current moment. However, perhaps this will also encourage you all to support and visit other farmers uh, more specific to your area for whom maybe making a daily podcast or video or whatever is a bit out of the cards, but can spare an hour or so here or there to show you all how it works. Anyway, thoughts on all that? Was that interesting, depressing, enlightening, none or some of each? Uh, either way, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, microalgae, just normal transitions like that. BRB. Today's episode of Grows Daily is brought to you by Ring of Fire. What if you could turn your brush problem into black gold? The Ring of Fire Biochar Kiln is your spring tool for soil transformation, converting woody debris into high quality biochar in just hours. Biochar will kickstart your compost, retain water and nutrients in your soil, and provide habitat for beneficial microbes. Now $19.95 with flat rate shipping, their spring sale runs through June. Don't wait to boost your soil and optimize your inputs. Visit ringoffire.earth slash growers now to learn more. Also, for more information on biochar, check out the No-Till Market Garden podcast interview with Kelpie Wilson, inventor of the Ring of Fire kiln, that we will link in the show notes. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this content, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Does this show bring you $2 worth of value a month? Five? some entertainment, consider uh, signing up over there at patreon.com. I will try to get to questions from everywhere that questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, today's Patreon question comes from T Reaper, who writes, quote, Hey, Farmer Jesse, I work as a retail nursery person in San Jose, California, and have been researching microalgae lately. Our main fertilizer supplier switched from mycorrhizae to microalgae, so their product no longer needs an expiration date. I'm wondering if you have any insights on microalgae use for farmers or home gardeners. Sorry if you already did an explanation and I missed it. Thank you for all the work that you do. I learned so much from your videos. They keep me more informed, which helps me at work and in my garden, end quote. Uh, all right, great question, and thank you, T-Reaper. Uh, so microalgae is somewhat of a new hot topic, a uh, new hot amendment on the scene, and it had been popping up in research lately, and I'd heard you know, of people using microalgae, but I had not heard of someone switching from mycorrhizae to microalgae altogether, especially since a lot of the research seems to suggest the two work really well together. But anyway, uh, to back up, what even the heck is microalgae? Microalgae are unicellular organisms, and as an amendment, it's largely considered a biostimulant, which means roughly what it sounds like it means. The presence in the soil of a biostimulant effectively stimulates other important biological processes. It's like half-calf, but for microbes. And also nothing like half-calf, but you get the idea. And microalgae is gaining interest for a wide range of properties that these organisms bring uh, along with them. Nitrogen-fixing enzymes, soluble amino acids, polysaccharides, and more. Basically, they produce chemicals that plants and microbes like and can use. Their use in agriculture, these microalgae, uh, have been linked to improving soil fertility, improving plants' abilities to fight off natural non-pest stressors, think heat and drought and that sort of stuff, but also spark defense responses against pathogens and infection and improve nutrient uptake from soil and nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, etc. Application-wise, microalgae can be used in soil drenches, uh, seed priming, and foliar sprays, but like everything that sounds too good to be true, there is a catch. For one, microalgae production is at present still quite energy and time intensive and not entirely considered environmentally or really economically sustainable, though people are, of course, working on improving the efficacy of, you know, its production. So that may change or it probably is in the process of changing. Also, microalgae is considered by at least some of the research I found to be most effective when paired with other fertilizers and or mycorrhizal fungi and not necessarily as a sole fertilizer. That isn't to say the product you are using here, T-Reaper, is inadequate, 
especially if it's working, but rather uh, if someone wanted to start employing this substance for themselves, that they may generally be better off pairing it with other things like mycorrhizae, uh, fish fertilizers, and other nitrogen sources like perhaps compost, uh, etc. For the best results where it is and will likely continue to be used most, I imagine is in places like cannabis and or hydroponic production, though the soil-based results are certainly intriguing. Market gardening usually gets these new, um, you know, kind of up and coming amendments after those more chemistry reliant, chemistry minded horticultural pursuits have played with them for a little while. I will be curious to watch this idea and product as it becomes less expensive and as the research around it clarifies some of its uses, both uh, in place of and alongside certain other amendments, and of course, as it becomes more energy efficient to produce. If you are certified organic and interested in trialing this product, there are a few brands uh, out there on the market that are OMRI certified, which is like organic approved. And I would be curious to hear uh, from any of you who have tried microalgae and what uh, what you think. Have you used microalgae? algae thoughts uh, results anything you've noticed uh anyway great stuff always fun to explore these things love me some biostimulants all right uh up next we're going to take a quick break and then get an interesting question about fertilizing in three sisters planting in new somewhat abused clay ground brb Today's episode is also brought to you by FarmRaise. Still using QuickBooks for your farm's bookkeeping? You're wasting time and losing money. Farm finances can be overwhelming, but they don't have to be. FarmRaise Tracks is the all-in-one tool built just for farmers. Manage expenses, prep for taxes, run payroll, and plan for the future without spreadsheets or stress. Just clear, organized insights to keep your operation thriving. Thousands of farmers trust Tracks to make smart financial decisions all year long. It's time you did too. Use code NOTILL20, that's all caps, no spaces, NOTILL20 for 20% off the life of your membership at farmraise.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Farmhand. I started a CSA to grow food and build community, not to drown in admin work. Spreadsheets, emails, and pack lists take up too much time. If I could spend less time at my desk and more in the field, that'd be a win. Enter Farmhand. Farmhand automates billing, newsletters, websites, and member support, saving CSA farmers 20 plus hours a week. Focus on farming, not paperwork. See how Farmhand can help. Book a one-on-one -on -one demo with founder Ari at farmhand.partners slash no-till. That's farmhand.partners slash no-till. All right, back to the show. All right, I'm using the third segment today to get caught up on uh, one of our questions because, again, it's May now, which means the questions are coming in hot. Anyway, today's extra Patreon question comes to us from Patreon member Don, who writes, quote, I am new to this community but have been doing organic gardening whenever I had a patch of ground since 1974. Now I am starting a garden in a new facility we have. I'm up in extreme northwestern Nebraska on clay, and I mean bentonite, pure and simple, no soil horizon left on it where the prairie used to exist. I laid thick layers of old hay over it all winter and horse manure is in there and I am working in a little organic quality biochar, not much because I can't afford it, before planting. I am Choctaw and plant corn, beans, squash together and that's what needs to go in the first garden here. I know the beans will fix nitrogen but I also know corn is a heavy feeder. My corn is not a fancy one that gets real big or anything so at least there's that. I have some Trident's Pride Organic, Omri Certified, uh, Liquid Fist Soil Enhancer I have used on this clay substrate before in a nearby location on tomatoes and peppers and stuff, and I had fairly good results with it, but I think it was too much nitrogen for them. It's pretty strong stuff, but I find I am torn between thinking the corn needs a lot of nitrogen, especially to balance all that, that half-rotted hay that's still breaking down, and imagining I'll wind up with gorgeous corn plants that are all leaves and no ears, lol. Can you over nitrogen corn? Would it be safer slash better to put a big glop of the stuff way down in the center of the mound? I do mound planting about four corn per mound with the beans around them and leave it alone after that. 
or to work just a little into the soil a couple of times during the season, end quote. Okay, uh, love it, Don. Great questions. And I've been enjoying my exchanges with Don on the Patreon, and so hopefully I can be a little bit helpful here. Uh, so in general, when you over-fertilize corn or most grasses, what you get isn't necessarily like really tall plants with no ears. That's not so much corn style or the concern necessarily with grasses. The plants will be plenty happy. The concern is that you will just lose some of that nitrogen and potentially create a little nitrogen runoff. Uh, basically, the corn will use what it needs and then just leave the rest behind to off gas or run off after the next rain event. Uh, so I don't see any issue with adding the fish fertilizer, but I would add it sparingly and not necessarily right at sowing. I would sow the seeds, uh, allow them to germinate, and then add the fertilizer when the corn is either germinating or up a few inches so that the plant can rapidly utilize it and maybe, as you suggested, a few times throughout the season. The manure and rotten hay will be your long-term uh, nitrogen source, but the fish fertilizer will nudge the plant along and certainly get it going and outrunning things. Now, uh, what I would do here in Kentucky with absolutely no cultural tie to, to planting corn in this fashion is prime the seeds to ensure not only good uh, germination, but a good microbial presence right at germination. This is not something you would have to do, but basically I would take a very small amount of the that fish fertilizer, water and squeeze the liquid from compost, typically by putting it in some cheesecloth or a compost tea bag, soaking it a little bit and then squeezing out the resulting, you know, dark liquid and soaking the seeds overnight before sowing them the next day. But again, I'm not sure if that would make sense for you in the Choctaw tradition, but or, or frankly to be necessary, but it may help with the initial growth uh, and germination and establishment. I do think having that fertilizer on hand to utilize for your new garden or on that rough sounding clay will be helpful as a tool to help get your garden rolling in this first year and ensure the corn success while it helps you to start recovering that soil. Anyway, I do hope that was helpful, Don, and the best of luck to you this spring. Keep us updated on how uh, on how it all goes. And uh, Don started a nice thread just for the listener over at No-Till Growers Forum for people just beginning with No-Till to connect with other growers trying to navigate this definitely complex world, which I will link that uh, thread in the show notes. Otherwise, that's a wrap on this Tuesday. Don't forget, we are now officially a 501c3, so donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. You can learn more about how to do that that uh, in the show notes. Please make sure to like and subscribe and or follow wherever you're getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out. Always enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors. And if you'd ever like to sponsor the show, you can reach out to farmer Michelle at notillgrowers.com. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music, Mike Hilbert for the production help and editing and the team at No Till Growers. Also a shout to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook by me or the Seed Farmer by Dan Breesbaugh over at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in the month of May, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to Joshua and Red Polo Farms. So you will remember from yesterday that we are standing in a field in North Yorkshire, Yorkshire, Yorkshire in the 1950s when the, uh, the farmer, Kate, sees a bright flash of light come across the sky. And when the light clears, uh, all of a sudden, Kate sees this like group of people standing in the garden, oddly dressed and holding uh, small black devices in their hands, looking panicked. Now, Kate calls out for them uh, and, they, and they look absolutely terrified, like ghost white. And excuse me, one of them says, you know, in, in an odd, perhaps American accent, can you tell us where we are? And Kate responds politely, you're standing on my cabbage is where you are. But the group didn't find that very funny. Uh, they then asked if Kate had any Wi-Fi and Kate said, I don't know what Wi-Fi is, but if you'd like to come in for some soup, I can try to help you out uh, over some supper. Kate hadn't anticipated sharing the lentil soup necessarily, but figured these folks looks lost, looked lost and to be frank, Kate's uh, lentil soup this week was really, really good. So they all go in to enjoy some supper. So that will be tomorrow on the greatest supper guests of North Yorkshire. I can't wait. Thanks for watching and or listening. We will see you tomorrow.